Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining our webinar today um, on dementia and multimorbidity and late life disease. We'll be covering different longitudinal and multimodal data science approaches for analyzing this data, including large scale data like uh, UK Biobank. Now we'll jump over and introduce our speakers for today. These are listed in order of appearance. We'll be kicking off with Paul Matthews from Imperial College London. Um, who will be giving an introduction to uh, UK Biobank and like studying dementia. Um, I'll be passing it over to Udo Bifitani, um, who will be diving a bit more deeper into image biomarkers, then kicking it over to Ben Sun, who will be discussing uh, crossing this with proteomics. Then over to uh, Cynthia Sandor, who will be talking about wearables and other biomarkers. David Llewellyn will follow afterwards, developing uh, AI tools for phenotyping, and then um, kicking it over finally to Ben Busby to wrap this all up and how you can perform some of these analysis that will be talked about by our speakers on the You Could Be Wrap. I mentioned the community. I won't uh, bore you again with just talking about that, but you can find, um, you can join it by scanning that link and head directly to there. Again, it only takes a couple minutes and you don't need to be an approved researcher or anything to join. If you are a researcher from a low or low middle income country or an early career researcher, you can get funding to work on the research analysis platform and you get reduced access fees to the tier three data. That's the large scale data and genomic data um, that you can um, gain access to with UK Biobank, including the upcoming release at the end of this year. So um, if you meet either of those criteria, um, you can apply um, on the UK Biobank website and it's super easy to join. So if you scan that and the application only takes a few minutes um, and is also in the related content section. If you're a commercial organization looking for assistance in starting to analyze like new proteomics data or any upcoming kind of data releases on UK Biobank Wrap, the DNA Nexus team is here to help. We can help you cut the time from analysis to results and get the results you need more effectively and much quicker. Uh, we help UK Biobank researchers navigate the rich data set, understand the insights that researchers can derive from new data types like proteomics, develop tools, and get the most out of UKB RAP. Um, and we have various flexible package options available. And you can request more information by scanning the QR code or clicking the link again in the related content section. So let us help you be the first to publish, first to market, and you can scan that QR code or click the link now. If you are part of the UKB RAP community already performing research and you want to promote that research, uh, we also have an application to get involved uh, to participate in upcoming events or host an event, um, be highlighted in our newsletter spotlight, which is now also on the DNAX blog, or organize a meetup. We're very flexible and our team will work with you on that. So that is uh, available via that bit.ly link and again, the related content section. And then finally, if you are brand new to the UK Biobank Research Analysis Platform and uh, need help a little bit more understanding that, um, this is the all-in-one platform where you can analyze uh, the UK Biobank data and gain access to cloud infrastructure and analysis tools. If you're an approved uh, UK Biobank researcher, you already have access to this. So you can just sign up today and receive 40 pound credit for working on the platform just for signing up. So that is related, available again in the related content section and you can scan that QR code. All right, I think that's finally enough from me. I'll be handing it over to Paul Matthews to kick it off. Thanks, Brenton. It's great to uh, great to be here with uh, with all of you in the, in the virtual world. Uh, today we're coming together to uh, talk about UK Biobank as a resource for uh, dementia research, but actually highlighting um, the particular power that now comes uh, by by being able to access both data and tools in a, a, a big data computing environment through DNA Nexus. So let me quickly lead you through a few, um, uh, a few high points. First talking, uh, first talking about the, uh, uh, the UK Biobank resource and why it is so special uh, uh, and offers such opportunities for UK, uh, for, for dementia research. The UK Biobank research um, is a large uh, prospective longitudinal study that was developed by um, uh, soliciting volunteers from across the United Kingdom, selecting 
people from a diverse range of environments through 22 pop-up assessment centers. Um, it started uh, more than uh, uh, in, uh, 15 years ago with uh, recruiting half a million people across England, Scotland and Wales. Um, from the time of first recruitment with subsequent updates, there's been comprehensive collection of data concerning lifestyle and environmental factors, medical history of, of family and one and the individual volunteers, um, uh, associated cognitive, hearing, vision tests, multiple physical measures, and collection of an enormous range of biological samples uh, from blood, urine, saliva, and uh, with increasing expansion to, uh, uh, to other uh, uh, potential modalities. Consent to access all medical and other healthcare related uh, records to death um, has been provided by each of the volunteers, and they've additionally agreed to be recontacted for further assessments as they might come online. Um, since it started, only about a thousand people have withdrawn. It's an enormously committed pop population, and that means that they're providing, uh, continuing to provide uh, an enormously rich set of phenotyping data. Uh, uh, the the data uh, is remarkable, uh, both for its uh, for its depth because of its depth and size, but also because it's accessible. The data is open to access on application by academic and industry researchers across the world at really minimal cost. Moreover, it continues to grow literally day by day as electronic healthcare uh, data is added on participants as they interact with the health system in the UK, but also as processed data uh, like uh, derived phenotypes is, are returned from users. And then um, uh, there have been a variety of enhancements and I'll describe one in a, in a moment. Uh, the partnership with uh, DNA Nexus is allowing the barriers for really advanced analytics and particularly those involving um, the whole genome sequencing available on all 500,000 uh, participants in UK Biobank uh, through um, the DNA Nexus cloud um, uh, along with tools for uh, uh, their study. Now, uh, what is, um, in for those interested in neuro, late life neurodegenerative diseases, um, this offers some really special opportunities. There are already um, uh, well over 10,000 people with um, major late life um, uh, uh, neurodegenerative disorders, including Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease. But, but we have epidemiological curves and aging trends in the population that over the next decade or so, there will be considerably more added. So by 2030, there should be uh, somewhat over 50,000 people uh, in the UK biobank population who will have developed neurodegenerative disease. That means that what, when, as we are observing these people over the next um, several years, we will be watching neurodegenerative disease in it preclinical phase, the very phase that we want to understand in order to uh, begin to deliver treatments early. The population is diverse, although not strictly representative of the UK population, and one can study, um, uh, it is large enough that one can begin to study important differences between, for example, ethnic groups across the UK. Uh, here, this is a recent study looking at the risks of late life dementia um, amongst the ethnically black population uh, with a, an, um, an incidence curve uh, uh, by age uh, shown on the left in blue relative to the um, ethnically white or ethnically Asian population curve shown below, um, really highlights the increased risk associated with eth the ethnically black population in the UK. Moreover, with lifestyle, uh, geographical, uh, and other information, there are ways of dissecting that. I don't have time to go into those now. One of the um, kinds of observations that's also available is one can link each of the participants in UK Biobank back to postal code information um, and link then that postal code information to uh, uh, UK Met Office data uh, to begin to understand important things about uh, both variation 
in, uh, in climate uh, over the last couple of decades, but importantly, uh, air pollution. Uh, here is uh, one of the em emerging um, areas of real interest by investigators with the UK biobank population has been in studying the influence of particulate matter, microparticulate matter in the atmosphere on the incidence of late life diseases, including dementia. And for the first time, a, a clear association between exposure to these microparticulates and um, hippocampal volume related to cognitive uh, performance decline has been demonstrated. Now, that really highlights one of the really powerful things about the UK biobank participants. Not only are they phenotyped in conventional ways, but uh, clinical imaging is being performed on up to 100,000 of the participants. Over 60,000 of the participants already have had brain MRI, heart and uh, chest uh, thoracic MRI, abdominal MRI looking for fat distribution across the body, and um, DEXA looking at um, uh, able to assess um, uh, uh, skeletal uh, uh, muscle and bone uh, uh, distributions and um, uh, 3D uh, carotid ultrasound. This imaging is available and of enormously high quality, uh, growing day by day and uh, exciting. Uh, this um, starting this year, the, a re imaging of um, uh, 60,000 of these participants uh, will begin um, uh, with intervals between the initial imaging visit and the follow-up imaging visit ranging from two to seven years allowing uh, serial trends in organ shape uh, size and uh, texture um, uh, to be defined across the body uh, clearly important for dementias because aging associated differences in cortical thickness have been one of the one of the early things that's been shown to be really powerful and when one can do this across ages at this scale one can begin to make as many investigators have started to demonstrate already associations with specific genetic risk factors here for example you can see on the left, uh, associations with APOE4, uh, the most profound risk, the, the, the risk factor of high, uh, genetic risk factor of highest uh, effect for Alzheimer's disease, uh, as well as uh, in the case on the right, uh, looking for factors such as BDNF, um, uh, uh, polymorphism variation uh, that could drive um, uh, uh, modulation of this. The um, uh, new kinds of measures also have provided a really exciting um, uh, information relevant to dementias. Uh, uh, Steve Smith and his colleagues in Oxford looked at T2 uh, star hypointensities indicating uh, increased iron deposition in the brain. Um, uh, genetic association studies highlighted, a genetic association study highlighted a number of SNPs um, which turned out to be associated uh, spatially uh, with um, uh, deep gray structures and when they were uh, linked through EQTLs uh, to genes involved in, uh, uh, hemos in iron metabolism in the brain, really highlighting that iron uh, processing in the brain, uh, which is, uh, is a, both a risk factor for dementias, uh, but also a factor that is um, a, a common in the population as a whole. Um, new kinds of um, potentially low-cost prognostic tests can effectively be piloted in, at least for hypothesis generation, within the UK biobank population. One of the earliest of the imaging, in fact, the earliest of the imaging modalities to be added on to the UK biobank um, uh, data um, over 10 years ago was a first uh, pass with uh, of uh, optical coherence tomography um, for uh, about 100,000 of the participants. Um, analysis of this subsequently, um, and all of the data is available for download uh, by interested investigators, um, has highlighted that retinal nerve fiber layer thickness um, becomes a... Um, a significant correlate of um, a cognitive performance decline um, uh, through um, uh, on repeat assessments relative to baseline, suggesting that retinal nerve fiber layer 
paper thickness an examination that can be completed in under a minute using relatively low cost equipment may provide at least at a population level uh, an important marker i'm pleased to say that in the Im re-imaging visit that's now uh, started uh, this year on and is intended to uh, be conducted on 60,000 of the um, those imaged um, at baseline, uh, there will be an advanced optical coherence tomography uh, investigation added, allowing this kind of data to be extended in powerful new ways. Now, because UK Biobank tries to collect data in as raw a form as possible as uh, to make it available to researchers who are interested in trying to process it, enhance it through their processing and provide it back to the community uh, as a, a new kind of derived phenotype. There's been an enormous catalysis of ways of using the imaging data sets in new ways. One of them has been uh, led by Carla Miller and her group in Oxford um, for generation of quantitative magnetic susceptibility maps uh, using a variety of, uh, using secondary processing of data that they were able to download from the DNA from the um, uh, UK Biobank uh, uh, data set. And with these, um, they could perform an even more powerful the GWAS study, uh, which uh, extended the previous observations with the T2 star um, to identify a much richer set of genes, again, linking back to iron and iron homeostasis in the brain as an index of neurodegeneration. And finally, this data set is, is growing in, the data available is growing in capacity all the time as um, uh, with the enhancements, uh, there are creative ways of extending um, the uh, range of measures that can be applied. One of the most exciting for me has been uh, work by Tom Oakle, Mike Chappell, Steve Smith, and their colleagues in Oxford to add on to the re-imaging visit uh, a very short arterial spin labeling sequence, uh, which um, allows cerebral blood flow imaging across the population. In very preliminary data that Tom presented at the um, International Society for Magnetic Resonance in Medicine recently, uh, you can see here a plot uh, in blue of the gray matter uh, cere cerebral blood flow in the UK biobank population as a function of age, showing with remarkable clarity um, the decrease um, in um, cerebral blood flow uh, in um, the aging population. This combined with measures as I've just described, like T2 star, QSM, and standard structural measures promised to, to provide an enormous range of uh, exciting tools for looking at the preclinical phase of uh, uh, neurodegenerative diseases as they evolve. So let me stop there. Just, um, I hope I've communicated some of my enthusiasm, highlighted the richness of the data set, the way it's growing over time, and the way users themselves are further enhancing what's available uh, for everyone who accesses it. Thanks very much. Brenton, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you so much, Paul. All right, I'm happy to turn it over to our next speaker, Ludovica Grifanti. Apologies. Uh, Ludovica, take it away. Thank you. Well, thank you for inviting me to talk to you today. And I'm going to follow up with some more imaging, um, brain imaging to be precise, and um, tell you a bit about uh, the contribution of UK Biobank imaging to dementia. So um, as Paul said, the uh, UK Biobank was designed as a prospective epidemiological study. So without a particularly primary disease of focus, uh, but actually is already contributing and will contribute to dementia research and clinical practice. So today I would like to highlight some key components of the UK Biobank MRI acquisition protocol and measures that are of interest to dementia research. I will give you a couple of examples of imaging correlates in the UK Biobank that are relevant to dementia. And then I would like to talk to you about what we are doing uh, in Oxford in terms of implementing the... Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> Okay, uh, so implementing the UK Biobank imaging in a memory clinic setting. Um, so um, 
as you probably already know, the UK Biobank Brain MRI protocol uh, includes six uh, imaging modalities, uh, now soon seven with ASL, um, that already cover a broad range of research applications. Uh, but actually, four of them are the same type of sequences that are now uh, recommended also to be included in clinical protocols for dementia. And so we definitely are capturing the information uh, that is relevant to dementia. Uh, then the, at, in the uh, UK Biobank, the images are processed uh, with the uh, UK Biobank pipeline uh, that I'm not going to go into the details of because there are dedicated webinars to that um, that I listed here and you will find the links in the chat. Uh, but basically the output of these pipeline is um, processed images that highlight different characteristics of the brain and also uh, imaging the right phenotypes, so summary measures that describe the characteristics of the brain. And currently, the pipeline uh, already extracts over um, around 4,000 IDPs per subject, so a huge amount of information uh, about the brain. Now, what is uh, particularly relevant for dementia, as we know already? So, um, at the moment, there is not only a more and more consensus on which sequences to acquire, but also how to interpret brain MRI uh, for dementia. And so there are now a growing um, set of recommendations and guidelines on a standardized way to report brain MRI for dementia. Here is just one example from the European Society of Neuroradiology. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details of, uh, of the report, but I just want to highlight two main sections, um, which is the um, importance of describing vascular pathology, so um, signs of the disruption of the brain microvasculature, and also uh, the uh, description of atrophy patterns, so how much and where the brain is shrinking abnormally and how the IDPs can help us describing this pattern. Well, for vascular pathology, there are uh, at the moment three IDPs of interest to describe white matter hyperintensities. So the volume of lesions of presumed vascular origin in the brain, uh, we have a measure of the total volume and also split into the two main categories, periventricular and deep white matter hyperintensities. And then with respect to the atrophy pattern, we have way more IDPs that can help us describing that. Uh, over 1,500 IDPs that describe um, the volumes of uh, cortical and subcortical areas, um, tell us about the uh, area of a certain brain region and cortical thickness. So again, we definitely have IDPs that we already know are important for dementia. So what can we do with that is then take advantage to the rest of the rich information in the UK Biobank and study brain as uh, associations. So, for example, in this study by Michelle Felsman, uh, she looked at one of the components, so the um, vascular pathology, in particular white matter hyperintensities, and the relationship with risk factors and behavior. And, for example, uh, she looked at the relationship between white matter hyperintensity volume and age, which is the strongest risk factor for these type of lesions, but also at the relationship with cardiovascular risk factors like hypertension and waist to hip ratio as a proxy of visceral fat. And what she found that these and other cardiovascular risk factors were significant predictors of white matter hyperintensity load. And because the pipeline not only gives us numbers, but also maps, she was able to then look at the spatial pattern of these relationships between white matter hyperintensities and, um, and these risk factors. And then uh, she also looked at uh, behavior, so looking at the association between white matter hyperintensities and reaction time as a proxy of uh, executive function. And then uh, a second example, again, about vascular pathology is another uh, a similar plot to um, what Paul showed before. So a genome-wide association study of the um, volume of white matter hyperintensities and 
um, all the SNPs uh, that we have in UK Biobank. Um, and for example, one of the main uh, hits of these GWAS is um, significant associations on chromosome 17 that already replicates and extends previous studies uh, that found that um, there are associations with uh, genes in chromosome 17 that are related to glial proliferation and potentially gliosis, which is a marker of microvascular injury. So again, these associations can help us further understanding the mechanisms behind the signs that we already know are important for dementia. And uh, you can now find the um, GWAS studies of all the IDPs uh, of the imaging uh, phenotypes in our open uh, Big 40 interactive server. And then I would like to uh, finish off by telling you how we are using the knowledge that we uh, learn from UK Biobank to implement advanced brain MRI in a memory clinic setting. So um, I'm not, I don't have time to go into much detail, uh, so I link here uh, our website. But the Oxford Brain Health Clinic is a joint clinical research service um, that was opened in 2020 and uh, where uh, people, uh, NHS patients uh, that are referred by their GP to a memory clinic appointment come to our center and receive an enhanced set of assessments, which include a brain scan using the UK Biobank protocol. And so how do we do that? Uh, what we do is we reordered and split the original UK Biobank protocol in two sections. We have a set of sequences that we call the core clinical sequences that are those that I've showed at the beginning that we know are important for dementia and recommended uh, to help dementia diagnosis at the beginning. And they um, it's 16 minutes long, um, and this is what is reported then by the neuroradiologist and uh, goes back to the clinical records. And then if the person is willing to participate in research and stay a little bit longer in the scanner, we complete the full UK Biobank protocol, which means that now what we are getting is UK Biobank quality data on a real world population. And what we are doing now is adapting the analysis pipeline to be able to um, be used on this population, which has a higher amount of uh, lesions and atrophy uh, than the more healthy population. But what the, uh, the IDPs that we find are in line with the scoring that was given by the neuroradiologists on the image. And so what we will be able to do is uh, look at the associations of all the imaging derived phenotypes that you see here. Every dot here is an IDP, so we get the same IDPs as UK Biobank in a memory clinic population. And in particular, uh, these examples shows the associations between these IDP and cognition. Um, and with this, I would like to thank all the people involved in the studies and the funding bodies and you for listening and inviting me today. Thank you so much, Ludvika. All right, I will hand it off to our next speaker, Ben Sun, to take it away. Thank you, Brenton. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, and thanks for all the people who have joined the call today. Um, so today, I'm going to talk, uh, take things in a slightly different gear. You've heard a lot about radio, radiology, MRI imaging, and it's also radio genomics, to, um, uh, that's well, you know, exciting data that's developing and still accumulating uh, in UK Bell Bank. Uh, but I'm going to take things on a different trajectory and talk about some of the other omics that are also uh, available in the UK Bell Bank cohort. And some of you might already be aware that the proteomics data that's emerging also within UKB uh, in the recent few months uh, and also exciting developments still to come. And, and rather than focusing on uh, proteogenomics, um, I think I will focus on, uh, today a bit more about lifelong disease prediction using the proteomic data. Um, so obviously, in, in, it's, UK Biobank is quite an exciting resource in that all these other multiple omics are leveraging the advances in technological capabilities and accumulating data on, on unprecedented levels in parallel, 
it's uh, it feels like multiple people are working on the same jigsaw puzzle at the same time and trying to piece together this complete picture of multiomics uh, in both disease and also control uh, samples, you know, in this populational effort. So obviously leverage on the backs of proteomic developments where we are able to extend the multiplexing capabilities from dozens to hundreds and now up to thousands uh, of proteins uh, in the same samples is remarkable how that's come a long way uh, over the last decade or two. And similarly can be said about high throughput uh, metabolomic data that are also emerging uh, in UK Biobank uh, as well. And obviously not to neglect the other health omics data that are also still accumulating in parallel uh, within the UK Biobank. And then because of these additional uh, advances and capabilities, uh, what naturally comes from that is additional insights on both health and disease states that are accumulating beyond what is traditionally known with conventional factors, which are largely limited to single plex data, but also limited uh, demographic information and risk factors. And as you can see, that expansion in the, in the omic data space really allows us to glean mean to what additional information, additional insights that can be gained uh, from these uh, data. And that also allows us to explore what's shared in terms of the contributions from multiomic. Uh, obviously, you'd expect there to be some overlap, despite this, these being independent. Uh, technological methods uh, in terms of their contributions to disease and health that might be shared uh, elements as well as marginal independent contributions that are also becoming more and more evident. And you can really, really do that when you measure a lot of these in the same population and the same samples at the same time points, which is what we're beginning to see uh, in UK Biobank. And this also paves way for potentially new multiomic based math models, which will become comparable and potentially exceed performance of existing so oligo risk factor based uh, models due to what was available uh, in the previous generation. So I'm just going to take you uh, an example of what we did uh, in terms of using the protein or uh, leveraging the proteomic data for longitudinal disease uh, prediction. And in essence, we use the Olink Explore platform that are currently available uh, now in UK Biobank to the researchers uh, worldwide uh, and linking to both instances uh, of uh, diseases through both uh, GP uh, link data as well as ICD-10 code uh, EHR data. And by training you know, a, 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 a Cox pH uh, model uh, using uh, penalized uh, 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 models as well as uh, you know classic machine learning approaches with cross-fold validation and splitting that into both a, a test and training data set, we're able to evaluate the performance of the proteomic data in terms of predicting disease uh, incidences and uh, project that into the future for disease incidence risk across time. And as Paul has well uh, shown in that slide, we expect this power of this approach to accumulate and improve over time as more and more people within this cohort start to develop diseases, especially the common diseases uh, as as well as the rarer diseases that accumulate, especially with age uh, and comorbidities as this population begin to age as we follow them longitudinally. And we were able to compare some of this to baseline demographic factors, which are still quite uh, a major contribution of disease risk, especially age and gender still you know, remains as the main key factors uh, in contributing to disease risk. But we also uh, compare this to fully adjusted models where we introduce commonly measured uh, demographic risk factors such as um, uh, alcohol and smoking and, you know, and educational deprivation, uh, as well as BMI. And, and this allows us to compare to see how much the the proteomic scores are essentially absorbing the risks explained by demographic factors, but also allows us, us to see what additional factors uh, this uh, the proteomics may explain beyond what is conventionally measured. And, and we're able to uh, evaluate this uh, essentially across the subset of around 50,000 uh, people that were measured, obviously splitting that into cross uh, training data set as well as uh, test data sets there. 
So what we find is quite um, interesting and remarkable is that compared to just the baseline model with just age and gender, we see improvements to different extent across a range of diseases that we tested, trying to cover a lot of the common diseases, but also across multiple uh, disease systems and organ systems as well. And you can see the gain in terms of the AUC and the PRAUC, which also accounts for some of the case control imbalances that you get in some rarer forms of diseases. We see that in the improvements uh, in prediction uh, beyond traditional factors, both in age and gender, but also age and gender plus the other risk factors I mentioned on the bottom there. And you can see that we get improvement across a range. The interesting thing you can see that for lung cancer, for example, you can see that with age and gender, there's a vast improvement. But once you account for the smoking, uh, the improvement becomes much more marginal. And this all reflects the effects of the causal effects of smoking as a major risk factor in, in, in lung cancer. But for other diseases, uh, such as uh, ALS and and uh, some of the uh, for Parkinson's and some of the other diseases, you can see that the traditional factors don't explain as much and you get a much more uh, bigger marginal improvement from the proteomic data uh, across the board. And also we find that the the demographic factors are actually quite well absorbed by the proteomics, especially age and gender. And I think this is concordant with previous studies uh, using, you know, not just the Erlink array, but also other proteome array uh, in other cohorts to show that the proteomics are really good uh, at uh, predicting age and imputing age, uh, as well as gender uh, across multiple cohorts. So many of these uh, demographic and anthropometric effects are quite well absorbed uh, by the proteomic uh, uh, they, uh, effects as well. And obviously we clearly see these additional predictive and experimentary powers over conventional risk factors uh, with a range of diseases that benefit more than the others. Uh, and if you look at the absolute values in terms of the AUC predictions, is the proteomics does quite a pretty well good job uh, of explaining the risk uh, and prediction compared to some of the other omics data. And obviously that's not to say that it's strictly better because there's potentially shared elements and also some characteristics and some uh, parts where genomics, risk factors or potential specific gene genetic uh, uh, ca risk carriers for certain genes are still relatively robust uh, at predicting the instances of diseases. But on average, in general, we see that the proteomic uh, predictions in terms of the absolute uh, value, uh, predictive powers uh, are slightly higher. Uh, and that could reflect that the the, the, plas the matrix that we're measuring, which is plasma, is quite a well uh, reflective tissue of general disease state across uh, the bulk of diseases. And we, f and we also take uh, uh, as an example for, you know, one of the multimorbidal uh, uh, exemplars in type 2 diabetes and you can see that we with HbA1c that's also measured uh, as, a, as, as a quite a good standard for looking at long-term blood glucose control over a period of you know two to three months compared to the proteomics score we see a very good correlation between the risk the, the PRS in terms of the proteomic risk score against the HbA1c levels over time and you can see that the higher deciles versus the lower deciles there's this trend of increasing HbA1c uh, that's associated with increasing diabetic risk and you can see that the red and blues which are the cases in control controls for type 2 diabetes are also quite well separated in terms of the centroids uh, in the top left panel. And obviously with uh, diseases that are accumulating over time, you also expect some of the controls to all uh, in this overlap uh, area to also convert into cases over time as people develop uh, diabetes uh, as the population uh, grows older. And you can see that the bottom one really shows the performances compared to the what we get with, you know, polygenic uh, scores as well as age and gender being, you know, relatively uh, not so good at predicting and how things really improve uh, as you include any uh, the proteomic scores. And actually you still see a marginal improvement compared to just HbA1c uh, alone as well as HbA1c with other age and life factor adjustments to show that there's really still a marginal improvement that can be gained 
from adding in the, the proteomic data. And it's, this is quite interesting because a, a lot of the, you know, the clinical diagnosis for di type 2 diabetes are mostly based on, you know, long-term HbA1c levels, uh, as well as uh, uh, glucose measurements. Um, but the, the, and you can see that there's potentially future ways for us to improve uh, the risk stratification further by adding in addi additional omic layers. Uh, and obviously, the proteomics is a dynamic uh, space within the blood. Uh, so I think even though this is a cross-sectional data, you can still see how the uh, predictive value contributes despite not having access to multiple time point measurements. Uh, and, and obviously, the proteomic data is slightly different to what you get in the genetic data where things are fixed across a lifetime. So essentially, rather than getting a dynamic risk range, you have a fixed uh, genetic risk effect that country uh, across the lifetime uh, of an individual. So I guess in, in summary uh, that, you know, these multiplex and high dimensional data that are accumulating really have shown that there's improved prediction stratification beyond what's currently done conventionally. And obviously translating that to clinical space, it still remains a challenge because it involves additional calibration uh, of the data across and translatability into a clinical cohort. Uh, but obviously we see that there's emerging evidence, not from our work, but from recent work in the proteomic as well as the metabolomic space and the genomic space in terms of uh, prediction within each domain, but combining across these multiple omics and really uh, leverage advantages of each one. And that's something that could potentially be very valuable within UK Biobank where you have all those measures in one place. And the utility of the singular omics may also vary across the different diseases. You can see that metabolic diseases could benefit more than some of the other diseases. And, and there's, so there's some diseases that, that potentially closer to, you know, the blood plasma would may potentially benefit more where something separated uh, by uh, blood brain barriers uh, elsewhere. But obviously, uh, that's not to say that the blood plasma proteomes won't be useful in terms of prediction purposes. And, but it also highlights the importance of a deeply phenotype cohort at scale to explore these Contribute differential contributions of the omics uh, modalities together, and of course, with, there's, there's, there's no rules preventing us from uh, combining this with the radio, uh, radiology, and as well as the MRI images. They are also available uh, in UK Biobank, uh, as the two previous presenters have already shown. Uh, you know, the the, the the potential for that is also uh, a lot. Uh, and the lastly, uh, you know, the, for people who want a bit more detail, there is a med archive preprint uh, that is uh, online for people to explore this uh, in a bit more detail. And obviously, are uh, very thankful of our uh, collaborators and the co-authors who have also contributed heavily to this, especially Danny, Ricardo, uh, and also uh, Chris, uh, who are our key collaborators there. So, I'll, wary of the time, I'll hand that uh, the mic back to Brenton. For our next speaker. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Ben. I'll hand it over to Cynthia. Cynthia, take it away. Hello, uh, my name is Cynthia, and I'm working in the Nebantia Research Institute in Cardiff. And uh, my research focus is on Parkinson's disease. And the thing that we try to do is to predict who is going to have Parkinson's disease. First, just a bit of an introduction about Parkinson's disease is the first um, negative movement disorder. It's a movement disorder and is caused by a loss of the dopaminergic neuron in the very, very uh, small part of the brain that we call substance nigra, that you can see is just uh, if you cup the brain in this side. And one of the problems is when someone receives a diagnostic of Parkinson's disease, is already lost. 50% of this neuron. And it's really important to try to identify early as soon as possible uh, people in the general population and to find a low cost uh, biomarker that will be able to uh, catch uh, these people. Because Parkinson's disease don't start at the time of the diagnostic, it starts uh, probably 10 years early. And there is already some uh, subtle motor uh, symptom and non motor symptom among the non uh, non-motor symptoms that we know in Parkinson's disease, there is a, uh, this symbol that called RBD, REM sleep disorder. Uh, it's a very, very um, 
uh, sleep disorder where people move during during their dream and is unintentionally Parkinson disease. And UK Power Bank is probably a, a, the best resource to try to identify uh, people in this prodromal phase of Parkinson disease. And I told you that uh, Parkinson's disease is a movement disorder. And obviously, the most interesting uh, modality for us when you work was uh, this accelerometry study that was done 10 years ago, where 100,000 people uh, in UK Bow Bank was wearing a wristband activity for one week. And you must understand that the sensor that you have in this wristband activity is present in all our smartwatch Fitbit, Garmin, or Apple Watch. And here the thing what we did was relatively simple, is was to consider um, the time of this accelerometry study like a reference point. And we consider three groups. The first group was people that never received a diagnostic of Parkinson's disease, that is the majority of the participants of UK Bow Bank. You have a second group in green that is people that receive a diagnostic of Parkinson's disease uh, before or two years after uh, the accelerometry study. And we start to train our model by using uh, this control group and this second group of, of diagnostic group. And the idea was to predict uh, the last group, that the group that received a diagnostic of Parkinson's disease after the accelerometry study two years after the accelerometry study. We try to predict the event, the future. And it's why it's very, uh, Bank is very powerful. Now, the question is, what is the best data set to predict Parkinson's disease uh, in the population? And um, the thing is very interesting because, uh, with UK Bauer Bank is uh, you can play with different modalities and, uh, and you don't need to be an expert and uh, these different modalities that I think is very interesting. Even me, my background in, is in genetic, and I don't like to calculate pogenic score. And you have the chance in UK Bow Bank, you can access to the pogenic score that has been uh, calculated by genomic PLC, and they are more accurate than uh, anyone. And you have also, for example, the family history. And we consider that was uh, the genetic component uh, of uh, is a modality that corresponds to the genetic. But you have also a lot of blood biochemistry um, data set. Uh, for example, we know that the level of the vitamin D can be a risk factor for Parkinson. You have the lifestyle uh, also uh, that, for example, drinking and smoking is protecting for Parkinson's disease. And uh, there is all uh, prodromal symptoms that are reported also in, inside of UK Bow Bank. You have some individuals that are reported to have this uh, sleep disorder, RBD. We know that also the depression uh, can announce uh, Parkinson's disease, also the constipation. And you have the accelerometry. You can start to play with, uh, in the term of the accelerometry, with the processes of the accelerometry. But the thing after this we try to do is to process uh, the accelerometry and we Uh, derive a lot of sleep and activity measure. And uh, and of course, you can combine uh, all this information together to see if you can derive a model that is more predictive. And uh, the thing is also very interesting with the Cable Bank, you can try to test different models with different group of control. And the first thing that we did was to consider matched control that have the same age, same gender. And as you can see, uh, we have three models that perform equally. So it is, uh, we try to evaluate the performance of our model. Our model is good to classify if an individual going or not to have Parkinson's disease. And uh, that the, the bar that you see is a confidential interval. And you can see that the best modality, uh, you have two models that perform equally. The second test was actually Uh, to consider unmatched control, but that are non affected by another disorder. And in this case, we have only the accelerometry uh, that uh, works uh, alone, that works better than the other model. We don't find uh, a better, um, we don't find a, that combines the different malady improve uh, the performance of our model. But the thing is very interesting is no. Uh, when you consider all uh, the UK Bow Bank participants and including a control uh, that can be affected by some other disorder. And in this case, you see, for example, the modality 
where you consider the prodromal symptoms are predict, uh, unpredictive and the reason is because uh, the prodromal symptoms are not necessarily very specific for Parkinson's disease. They can also announce some other disorder. The conclusion is actually here, the accelerometry alone can predict uh, Parkinson's disease in the general population. And no, uh, if you are interested to have more detail and if you want to see the code, uh, you have the preprint and soon you will have the paper uh, published next week. And also, yes, you have the link to the code. Thank you. I pass to David. Thank you so much, Cynthia. David, take it away. Thank you. So it's, it's quite amazing, isn't it, to think about the data that is already available from UK Biobank and, and the other types of data that are in the pipeline. I think, to be honest, the more you think about the concept of dementia itself, the more you realize how, what a challenging area it is to work in. And the, the models that we might build to make sense of this data need to reflect the questions that we actually need answering. And that sounds rather trivial, but I do believe that our understanding of dementia is very incomplete. If we take Alzheimer's disease, the, the, the best under, understood form of dementia, arguably, um, how many types of Alzheimer's disease are there? And I, I, I would struggle to answer that. I, I think we genuinely don't know yet. And what does it mean to talk about dementia as a continuum rather than discrete categories that we can put people, participants or patients into? The concept of mild cognitive impairment as this kind of intermediate state between cognitively normal and people who, with established dementia um, perhaps best typifies this uncertainty. And many people with mild cognitive impairment don't go on to develop dementia. I think when we talk about dementia, we're talking about two fundamentally different things. Underlying pathologies in the brain that we might detect through imaging or we might uh, post-mortem look at in the neuropathology. And on the other hand, the clinical syndrome of dementia, the disabling decline in cognitive function, which leads to difficulties with everyday activities, like remembering to take your medicines, managing your finances, and so on. And quite unhelpfully, the research literature in this field muddles the two. So when people are talking about vascular dementia, they're sometimes talking about vascular pathology, and at other times they're talking about the clinical syndrome of dementia, which is associated with the accumulation of vascular pathology. And the same would be true for other dementia subtypes. We're still struggling to grasp the idea that people's brains contain a mixture of pathology and the old is old and the age at which people in UK Biobank are just starting to get into, that mixed pathology is the norm. So in terms of multimorbidity, dementia is an incredibly challenging area. The good news is, I think, that machine learning approaches in particular can give us new insights and can help us to move beyond conceptualizations of dementia and dementia subtypes, which are largely based on uh, clinical judgment and to a degree the orthodoxies that we've inherited over the last hundred years and supervised machine learning for feature selection has certainly been helpful to ask questions like can we differentiate between people with them living with dementia and people who have mci or are cognitively normal you can see here just one example of um, hundreds of variables. This is taken from uh, random forest with extra trees. And you can see um, it, it, it's somewhat subjective where you would draw the line here. Um, the y-axis, the vertical axis, reflects the importance of the variables. And then it, they're just ranked in order of importance. So at some place, they flatten off, which is not a su surprise 
some features are not going to be useful for this particular question. Um, and, and I think it's useful to think about not just UK biobank data, but UK biobank data in combination with other studies and even with data that we might generate synthetically. So you can see here that we generated uh, four synthetic variables and we mixed it with real clinical data in order to allow us to evaluate the degree to which this noise um, is on the tail of this slope. And I think it's quite reassuring in this analysis that the, uh, the variables marked in red there uh, are on that, that kind of wilderness of importance. So, um, but, but there aren't necessarily a core set of features, even for a given very specific question. What we have learned, though, when we look in UK Biobank and when we look in other similar data sets, is that there's a degree of substitutability. Like you can drop variables and others will pop up to replace them. But the, but the most important thing is that a range of data modalities are represented. If you only look at cognitive data, you can do that very elegantly and quite successfully. But as you've seen with Cynthia's analysis in Parkinson's disease, it's really only by combining di different data modalities that the strengths and weaknesses of those different data modalities complement each other and build more and more powerful models. Now, the composition of those models, again, depends on your question. Your dementia risk starts before birth, arguably. In early life, we, um, we know that influences, uh, they still matter for your late life dementia risk. Midlife risk factors start to then kick in. The underlying pathologies may be very subtle, may not even be detectable at this point, but you've got genetics, you've got lifestyle, you've got environment, all mashing together and potentially interacting in a way which does, requires UK biobank scale data to interrogate. Later on, as people move into uh, later life, the signs and symptoms of dementia start to become more apparent. Mild cognitive impairment becomes more common. Dementia itself becomes more common. And there's a shift in the predictive problem from uh, upstream risk factors through to the downstream consequences of dementia itself. Um, and you even get these curious reversions in the data where midlife risk factors can actually start to become apparently protective in later life because they are being influenced by reverse causation and the onset of dementia itself. So an incredible riddle, but something that we are starting to get a handle on. So we take the same data here, you can see the, the same features, but we've just, and we've left them in the same order. They were ranked before to detect dementia. This time it shows their relative importance for the differential diagnosis. And the comparisons between, for example, Alzheimer's disease and frontotemporal dementia, or vascular dementia versus dementia with Lewy bodies are shown here in a color-coded fashion. Now, there are far too many features to, to dwell on the individual uh, features here, but the point is that variables over to the right that are completely useless and, and actually perform worse than our synthetic noise variables are crucially important for differential diagnosis. So the questions that we ask need to reflect the question, the answers that we actually need. We need to be so careful about that, but that these approaches are incredibly powerful. And we can then ask questions like, how similar are individual participants to each other? Um, you can do heat maps of uh, similarity across individuals. Um, and you can use things like unsupervised machine learning to cluster and potentially uncover hidden patterns in the data. What's interesting is you can then relate those back. If you use label-free data, you can relate them back to clinical diagnoses. And that, again, allows us to question, 
the validity and the meaning of the clinical diagnoses that are already captured in UK Biobank and are a reflection of the records, which in turn are reflective of clinical judgment. Where our models predict people have dementia and they don't have a diagnosis of dementia, this raises questions about what the true gold standard is. Again, are we looking at pathology? Well, we can do that in UK Biobank. You've seen a richness of imaging data and we can look at the signs and symptoms relating to dementia. We can look at the genetics with polygenic risk scores. We can look at uh, the lifestyle and environmental factors. How do we do that optimally? I don't know. And I think that will require an enormous team effort to answer. And that's why we have set up uh, an, an international network designed to facilitate these kinds of collaborations, the Deep Dementia Phenotyping Network. Now, within this network, we have a specific special interest group just dedicated to looking at UK Biobank, which should be of particular interest to this group. And we run a lot of activities. I won't go into it, uh, detail, but we have used the DNA Nexus platform to run a hackathon uh, last year, NeuroHack. We had several different data challenges, and that was very successful. Are we there yet? No, we're not. But we are building multimodal models with increasingly rich, high-dimensional data to collaborate to do that. And you warmly welcome to join the Demon Network if you're not already a member. So it's free, and you can just go to demondementia.com to join. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. And I will hand it over to our final speaker, Ben Busby. Ben, take it away. Hey, everybody. How you doing? My name is Ben Busby. I work for DNA Nexus. And uh, Really, what I'm here to tell you is that everything you just saw, all the way from Paul's presentation uh, to David's presentation, everything, all of the compute you saw, all of that, that is doable on the UKB rep. And that's something that's very exciting to me, is that we can really uh, access all of this data um, and analyze it uh, in the cloud. And it's relatively straightforward uh, if we have a fundamental understanding of how cloud infrastructure works uh, in these particular data enclaves. The other thing I'm really excited about is the fact that these, the number of these data enclaves are growing very, very quickly, uh, both at DNA Nexus and also elsewhere. Uh, you know, as many of you know, uh, the All of Us uh, project is really sort of growing steam in the United States, and that should be available offshore into commercial companies uh, relatively soon. Uh, but then also, uh, you know, the Mexico City Biobank uh, is starting to be look, looked at by researchers. Um, and there's a whole uh, huge slew of private biobanks as well. Uh, Optum uh, is providing a biobank and, and a number of other companies uh, have, have biobanks that they make available to, for research. So I think, you know, going back to the UKB, uh, you know, we heard uh, a number of mentions of metabolomics. Uh, both from Paul and then Cynthia talked a little bit about both metabolomics as well as um, as well as blood biochemistry and those really echo each other. Uh, here we can see uh, in a paper from um, uh, Oxford University researchers, with a lot of collaborators, uh, that there is uh, certainly um, you know a, a detectable uh, trend uh, really associating uh, metabolomics uh, with dementia and so on. Um, and that's that's a very exciting uh, direction. Uh, but as David pointed out, I think it's really important to take a number of these uh, features together. Um, you know, we're seeing more and more uh, excitement around the proteomic data, uh, as Ben showed you. Uh, really, uh, we're able to see uh, sort of pre-disease states uh, with some of these uh, uh, proteomic analysis and really predict uh, those analyses. Again, I want to point out that the metabolomic data, the proteomic data, if you have tier three access, uh, really, or even tier two access in some cases, uh, you're able to see all of this data. And with tier three access, you're able to see this together with the genomic data. And that's that, to me, is very, very exciting. Um, so, and then, you know, I mean, with Ludo's work and uh, others, uh, you know, we're seeing uh, lots and lots of IDP. 
Um, and and I think it was exciting that Paul mentioned uh, OCT uh, extensively as well. Uh, but really, I think the cool thing is, you know, uh, the raw images are available. Uh, you can manage the raw images, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, but also folks are starting to make the code available for these types of analyses. So you can grab them off GitHub, off of Docker Hub, implement them in pipelines uh, and work on them in the cloud. And, and that's a really nice thing because I think, you know, I mean, many of us sort of come from a command line background. It's very easy to launch a Ubuntu instance or something. But really, I think when we, we compute on this scale, it's very important to think about uh, computing in discrete uh, sort of uh, applets or workflows, uh, however you want to think about them, such that instances get spun down and spun efficiently uh, because there is so much data here and so much compute to do on it. Uh, so that's, uh, that to me is really, really exciting. Um, and then, you know, you saw in a number of the presentations, uh, really integration. Uh, so, and, and that's really the point of doing IDP type work is so that it can be integrated with things like genomics, as well as many, many, many other phenotypes, as well as outcomes. Um, and so I think thinking about uh, sort of David's analysis of features, I think when we start thinking about subtyping, then those features start to become more and more coherent. Uh, and we need to do sort of iterative analysis on these types of things. But also, I mean, the more data we can get, I think the more the more helpful it is, because I think something to remember and, and something we forget often is that for a given sort of group of diseases, that all the indications may not be the same. For example, uh, if you're interested in, you know, uh, uh, if you're interested in uh, transcriptional networks, that may only really give you a clear indication for a couple of disease etiologies. You may need other data to really elucidate other disease etiologies. And so I think having a number of these things on tap uh, to really sort of peel that onion uh, is critical. But again, technically, we're able to do those things right now uh, on UK Biobank. And there's a whole slew of webinars if you go to community.dnanexus.com and click on the announcements page, there's a whole slew of webinars, not only on how to analyze specific data, but how to use uh, different uh, sort of data modalities and also computational modalities. So thinking about things like how to use Docker, et cetera, et cetera. And if, if you're really sort of new at this, you know, I, I, in my personal opinion, software carpentry really uh, opens the door to be able to do some of these things. So, and then I think it's really exciting to think about when we have these models, uh, we can also uh, add them back uh, to our original data sets and present them to our friends who are clinicians or statisticians, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And that's, that's uh, been really exciting, I think, to think about. This is a, a cardiology data set on the left here where we're uh, looking at uh, features derived from electrocardiograms um, and really thinking about a primary feature and uh, associating them with specific individuals. Uh, this is, to me, very exciting because uh, we can associate this now with sliceable individuals and then start to think about uh, really differential etiology uh, there. And this is something you can do. Uh, there's a tool on uh, the UKB RAP called the Dataset Extender uh, with other data on plays, they have similar types of things. We can also use real world data. And I think that's uh, really very exciting. And it, the UK Biobank is simply awash with it. So uh, that's, uh, that's really, to me, uh, a very exciting. And then again, I just want to go back into tools. There's lots and lots of uh, different sort of tool platform foundations uh, to get into large scale data sets. Uh, so Jupyter is leverageable with, without Spark, et cetera, et cetera. We have a number of flavors of Jupyter, uh, depending on what you're doing. And again, there's a whole bunch of uh, webinars available uh, to analyze this type of stuff. Real world, uh, RWD uh, stands for real world data. Um, and then, yeah, I think, again, uh, to echo David's point, really, uh, thinking about sort of new data models, as well as federated analysis from... Uh, other data sets is very is really one of the most exciting things here. Um, very recently, 
uh, UK Biobank was harmonized uh, to OMA. We'll be presenting that data in a few weeks. And so then if you have electronic medical record data from, say, the United States, uh, you'll be able to uh, upload that and integrate it with UK Biobank. Uh, and I think that's something that'll be very exciting. Um, and then, for example, uh, there's lots of public data sets out there, for example, in AWS ODP uh, that you can then also transfer into uh, the wrap very, very easily. So uh, those are uh, very exciting things and, and we can uh, expand on them uh, in the Q&A. Uh, that's all I wanted to uh, say there. Um, and what I'd like to do is bring all of the participants back up uh, for a, a relatively short Q&A session here. Um, but if you have questions for any of the participants, for all of the participants, please put them uh, in the Q&A box, uh, and uh, we'll try to get to as many of them as time allows. Um, so that said, I'd like to lead off. There's a question for Cynthia, uh, and it's that she mentioned that vitamin D can have a, an effect on uh, Parkinson's disease. Um, yeah. And so are there data sets that you've looked at in the UK Biobank uh, that have vitamin D levels? Yeah, you have a blood mucus chemistry that uh, I don't remember when uh, this data set was generated. I think it's one in my slide. It was, you know, it's relatively, it was after the accelerometry study, I think in, uh, in 2015. But I think we have just a one point, but on half million of the participants. And uh, if I remember uh, the vitamin D, the level of vitamin D is a risk factor of Parkinson's disease. Uh, thank you. Um, I appreciate that. Um, so maybe I could ask Ben Sun. So there's a question here that says, uh, you know, what are the different types of proteomics data, data available in the UK Biobank? But Ben, if I could ask you to think a little bit about sort of what the future of uh, proteomics data looks like for you. Uh, if you could talk a little bit to that and, and think about like specific cohorts, other technologies. I mean, what are you seeing coming in the next, in UK Biobank and elsewhere in the next two or three years? Yes, absolutely. So, I mean, for for this, we've been using the OLINK uh, platform, um, the Explore platform uh, within the Plasma. I think there's a few com considerations, I guess, to make. One is the tissues that things have been uh, assayed in. There's a lot of you know blood-based uh, proteomics and emergence, you know, of, of CSF uh, that are starting as well recently. Uh, but I think the ability to uh, measure in other tissue types rather than biasing yourself to just the plasma would also be an important area because a lot of the tissue compartments are really separated out. So things you see, as we already see that in CSF, things do look different even for the same assay technology compared to plasma. And you would imagine there are other uh, compartments or you know tissue uh, lo uh, locations or even tissue-based proteomics that would uh, reflect things locally that are not necessarily captured or represented uh, within the uh, just within the blood. I guess the other things is that the multiplex world is still uh, developing uh, in terms of uh, additional uh, protein biomarkers that can be assayed at the same time. If you look at the trajectory, you would anticipate that there'll be further proteomic expansions in terms of things that can be measured in the singular assay. Obviously, bearing in mind, uh, you know, uh, you have, you know, things, uh, different companies or different outputs or methodologies uh, that are also uh, increasing their capability, both in throughput uh, as well as the proteome coverage. Um, and and I think that's important to in in many ways. It's a bit like the genome sequencing world as an analogy, where do you measure what you have now, or do you wait for something better to come along uh, in a couple of years' time or in a few months' time, and wait for the technology to mature further? <clears throat> I think that's a dilemma, because given that we are dealing with limited sample volumes and that are so the, so these volumes of samples are quite valuable especially in bar banking settings so you really want to make the most of it in a single run uh, as much as possible i guess what the, the reassuring things that the technical reproducibility um and the cvs uh, are of these multiplex assays are very good uh, in general uh, from what we've seen you know with you know SOMA scan that we used previously
the Oling and a few other, you know, affinity-based assays. This, the, whatever is measuring is measuring reproducibly uh, if you were to repeat it, which is reassuring. Uh, and I think that that bodes well. Uh, and also when we compared some of the um, uh, data that were measured with biomarkers using a, a clinical biochemistry assay or uh, ELISA-based assay, that a small proportion of which are also uh, measured previously with UK Biobank, we see relatively good concordances uh, with those independent assays. Uh, so, so, so those I think are quite reassuring. Uh, but I think some of the calls in terms of when you measure it, given that the technology is constantly evolving, uh, is a very difficult uh, call to make uh, that you know involves a, a lot of stakeholders. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Uh, so, so if I could switch gears a little bit uh, and go to some, but one of the questions was about uh, cognitive tests and thinking about how to grab appropriate cognitive tests. Um, so, uh, Ludo or Cynthia, um, and or Cynthia, um, how do you really define cognitive impairment when you compare other data types uh, to that? How do you how do you think about uh, taking uh, cognitive function out of the phenotype data? Uh, in UK Biobank or other biobanks? I guess I, I can uh, give my, um, yeah, my view. So, well, some of the uh, cognitive tests that are done in UK Biobank, they can be kind of linked to some of the, um, of the tests that are acquired in clinic, but uh, there is definitely not a one-to-one -one map. So that's definitely one of the challenges uh, because there are not like, Obviously, the cognitive batteries that are done for dementia diagnosis are not generalizable enough that the biobank uh, would be appropriate, probably. Uh, but yes, some specific uh, tests can we use them to as a proxy for specific functions. So, for example, reaction time for executive function, and we try to find the, the equivalent, let's say, uh, test. Um, among the ones that are acquired in in our populations, for example. So, I guess. As far as I know, the best we can do at the moment is try to map domain uh, rather than test. And yeah, with the caveat that is we are not measuring the same thing. Interesting. Uh, Cynthia, did you want to add anything to that? I was m less, we, we didn't export too much the cognitive test uh, uh, for different uh, uh, reasons. It's, it's like the bone imaging is because our problem was to have uh, a comparable measure and, and enough uh, measurement on uh, on all the participants and I think if I remember uh, we don't have the same number we don't we don't have enough uh, individual for example for the brain imaging it would be really interesting for us in this study to integrate the brain imaging but if I remember the number was uh, relatively a uh, uh, small uh, in terms of overlap between individuals that get brain imaging data and the accelerometry, and I think it was the same problem for the cognitive uh, assessment that has been done uh, uh, later. Uh, thank you. Um, so a general question has has been asked twice. Uh, really, I think uh, more or less uh, for David, which is thinking about uh, outcomes that are algorithmically defined. Um, and, and thinking about sort of things that are defined uh, with models, comparing uh, EHRs uh, and so on. And maybe I can whittle that down to a, a more specific question, which is, David, so when you think about uh, subtyping um, based on this relatively vague, uh, these relatively vague or clinical assessment domains, um, how do you go about iteratively uh, sort of refining uh, the clinical subtypes uh, via algorithm? I think we can train against the existing subtypes used in clinical practice and take those as our gold standard. Um, that produces very interesting results. But the problem with that is that we know that um, they're catch-all categories which don't actually reflect homogenous uh, evidence-based or data-driven groups. So to take things to the next level, what we need is um, multimodal data captured prospectively. And then we use uh, a label-free, unstructured approach to the machine learning to explore what the underlying groups actually are so that we're not relying on clinical judgment from the beginning in order to 
benchmark performance against that. Um, the problem there is that people doing that in different data sets have come up with different solutions <coughs> to, the, to the simple question, how many types of dementia are there or how many types of Alzheimer's disease are there? So we're clearly not doing that in the optimal way because those solutions, those models can't all be right. So I think sometimes it's the limitations of the data and we've we've needed bigger data in order to answer those questions. And some of it, um, quite frankly, is limitations of the models, where, for example, if you're doing cross-sectional analyses and inferring um, from that, uh, trajectories, obviously that may not hold. Um, so this is the, the, the techniques, um, techniques like sustain, there are different, different approaches to modeling this kind of, of data are still being developed. Um, and I think this is an active area of research, but no one can answer the question, how many subtypes of dementia are there at the moment? I, I believe that. Uh, so with that, I, I think we'll leave it there. Uh, obviously, the, the new found interest <laughs> of the whole world in uh, deep, uh, deep learning, uh, I think will, will be very helpful to us. Uh, I'd like to thank all of the participants. Uh, also, Brenton, for giving a fantastic introduction. And the folks behind the scenes, uh, Oliver and Andre, for uh, answering lots of questions. So uh, thank you to everybody. And uh, I hope you have a great uh, rest of the summer. Uh, we will have uh, webinars on various topics for the rest of the year. So uh, check them out uh, in the announcements tab at community.dnanexus.com. So thanks again to the presenters. And uh, have a great day.